Welcome to the first edition of the Innovation and Investment Forum, the Amazon Bioeconomy. This is brought to you by Concert for Amazon and the Interstate Consortium for Ligo Amazon. We understand that the Amazon diversity has elements basic to all humanity to live better. Not only the fauna and flora are important to health, but the regulation of climate all around the world. But the people, culture, arts, soils, waters, cities, and communities. We understand that keeping this sustainable and alive, the Amazon, involves everybody here. We need to fix biodiversity using science and technology allied to sustainable development. Having at site better conditions of living for everybody who lives here. We want not only to keep the forest standing, but we want more standing forests, more biodiverse and sustainable, and least territorial and social inequalities. We understand that the Amazon bioeconomy and the economic and social activities from this biodiversity is a great ally to the sustainable development we seek. Welcome to participate in this forum. We want to bring to you new voices for this debate, to get to know different experiences and points of view for this market and find synergies and ways for a more resilient and prosper Amazon. These are talks for everybody, for the people who seek investment, options to invest, for people who propose public policies and everybody who wants to understand more about bioeconomy in the Amazon. Shall we? Welcome everybody, good afternoon. Welcome to the Investment and Innovation in the Bioeconomy Forum. We are starting one more panel of these two weeks of panels. And in this specific one, we focus on formation and bioeconomy. The idea of this panel is to try to work on training with human resources in the bioeconomy area bringing aspects of the academic area of studies and training, but as for the third sector related to the topic. We will have here very important professionals. And we also have very interesting comments from people connected to the formation of human resources, especially here in the Amazon. So let's have here our first participant, who is Luis Fernando Laranja. He acts as a director of Caetan Investments. They manage uh, this investment funds in the Amazon area. And academic as a professor in the University of Sao Paulo. So Luis Fernando Laranja, welcome. Thank you for your participation. Thank you, Jonas. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank for the invitation. It's a great honor to participate in such an event together with uh, renowned colleagues with great knowledge in this area. I would like to, to make my first remarks highlighting one issue, which is innovation. For us to go straight to the topic of this panel without further delay, I understand that the matter of innovation is key for the development 
of a model that is allied to conservation of the forests. So I would like to call your attention for one topic. I understand we don't have a clear model that could be applied in great scale in an allied way. Business opportunities with conservation. I think this is the topic. How can we ally these business with the conservation in a way to the strategy of innovation go through the development of business and not only to depend on these strategies. So in this aspect, I have insisted that we need to develop models that could be scalable. We have to remove the focus from, from little scale, small scale models and that are too punctual. We are through a situation of absolute emergency in matter of conservation of the Amazon. And the dynamics, the forces of regional economy is de are determined among other things by the supply chains, production chains acting in the region. And of course, I know that we have different Amazons and what I will say here could be applied to a certain region, but maybe not others. But I will give an example about the growth of the, the industry, for example, of soy and cattle growing. These are industries that are with a level of, of activity extremely high. They are growing very rapidly in the Amazon. And there is a business model that is very clear, especially with the prices of these commodities that in general, the farming commodities are high in price in, in past times. This is growing in force. I could give the example. Right now I'm in Tocantins, the border between Tocantins and Maranhão. I came yesterday from Northern Mato Grosso What's happening in the regional dynamics of these two places that I've been in the last 48 hours is hugely impressive. I've, I've lived in Alta Floresta for six years, 20 years ago, and what happened in the northern region of Marion is un unimaginable 20 years ago. So how can we balance this between the productive chains and I'm, I'm not criticizing the soy industry or cattle industry, but I'm just talking about the regional dynamics. How can we face developing other productive chains that could be scalable and forceful enough to balance this conservation game? This is the great issue here. It won't be with small community projects and not removing any merit of these types of projects. This is what I mean. We need to develop some alternative models that are more solid and tough and scalable. This is what we call bioeconomy. And in my point of view, they're not defined because they, they request, they require too much innovation. And this is why we are discussing here the formation in bioeconomy. We need research and development, investment in human resources. I could give an example here, a personal example of a, a venture that I developed kind of 20 years ago in the Amazon, the North Mato Grosso. This, is, this was a, a Brazil nut processing plant. I established as a goal to add value to this product that in, in great part, at the time, 70% of Brazil nuts exported by Brazil 
were exported with the peels. We didn't uh, peel them. And to develop more aggregated value, I was able to, to get the resources from FINEP. We had a joint venture with the University of Sao Paulo. So Northern Mato Grosso, I, I got the human resources and structure for the development of researches in Piracicaba in the University of Sao Paulo. And after three years, we developed this extra virgin uh, Brazil nut oil cream and flour and with that the aggregated value of this product was much higher and consequently the possibility that this company had to pay better the suppliers the communities traditional communities that were the collectors and suppliers of the nuts was increased so this type of development that i think that we need to seek but having as a goal something that can be scalable, that can impact a regional economy. Another example is in a company that we invested, it's close to here in Tocantins, There's, uh, the processing of the Babasu is another local uh, wealth. The company processes the Babasu and develops a series of process including activated coal it's high quality and this company is top in the water filtered filtering systems in brazil M many of you who are drinking water in in your homes could be using a product that is directly from this source but this demands a lot of research headed by people with um, excellent academic formation. So the entrepreneur behind this venture is, has a degree in uh, chemical engineering and spent years researching to add value to this biodiversity product and to make this a mainstream product of a, a classic market. So this is a, a venture that we invested in four years ago. They, they made 9 million and increased to more than 30 million reais. And this is a fruit of a process of innovation guided by people with high academic qualification, what generates a potential of adding value to Brazil and to local communities. So I would like to highlight this as an introduction, this plan of establishment of a productive chains of impact and scalability in the Amazon. Great, Luis, thank you very much. Very interesting what you said in your examples about investments. But that highlights this education stage. So since the base education until people reach university and perform quality research and be able to prospect and generate useful information, but it's necessary to invest in this education. Now with this idea, now we have Claudio Padua to talk to us, bringing interesting examples focused on education. Claudio Pado is a business administrator, biologist, and professor of the Departments of Forestry Engineering of the University of Brazilia, and he is a professor of the postgraduate studies of ecological research in IP, and the school is also known, known as ESCA. Claudio Pado received many international and national awards, and he is the associates of the bio Philic investments, environmental investments, and the park, park, park tour participations. He brings a lot of experiences for us to understand where we can invest in the education of people thinking about bioeconomy. Welcome, Claudio, and thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jonas. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, the organizers, for the invitation to be here. I'm going to start telling a story. Some years ago, 
Minister Sarney Filho from the environment. He was giving a lecture and I raised my hand and I said, Minister, you were really the Minister of Economy of Brazil. And he started laughing and said, you're crazy. Why? I am the Minister of the Environment. Why am you saying that? And I said, well, you, you have the responsibility of the biggest treasure that Brazil has, that is the Brazilian biodiversity. But this treasure, is locked inside a chest and this chest has a very complicated key to open and said okay so how does that work and i said the way to open it is with knowledge there is no other way and if we want to do this we have to use knowledge and the person who made me think about that were two authors one from chile and another one from venezuela who wrote some years ago, two important articles, and they are professor of MIT in Harvard, and two important articles about the development, the Lego of development. Everybody knows what Lego is, right? So what they say is, if you have the innovation, the discovery, very rarely some people discover things out of nothing just because they imagine. Usually they combine things that you create new products. So it works like a Lego game. So if you have small pieces, you only put together some small cubes or squares. If you have a lot of pieces, you can put together a train or a plane. So this Lego of knowledge is what made develop the knowledge in many different places and many economic developments in different places. Because when you already have all the pieces to put together, you move forward faster. So Brazil has a very diff a big difficulty to do that. And I'm gonna tell you that, yes, we do have experience that show that, to show that this is possible. Brazil is the biggest producer of paper pulp in the world. Where does the paper pulp production come from? This comes from an investor who owns the Susano paper factory a long, long time ago. After the World War, he was wondering where he could find paper and the paper was made of pine wood. And he thought that Brazil had a lot of eucalyptus tree planted for the railways, but they, they were not being used. So his son went to the University of Florida, United States with resources to make research about paper pulp. And the idea is that do not come back here if you don't bring eucalyptus paper pulp. And the history says that he spent some time and he went back with the paper pulp and transformed Brazil in the biggest producer of the world. That added with the knowledge from the university, of course. But at the same time, we produce airplanes. We don't produce automobiles, but we produce airplanes. Where do that come, does that come from? That comes from an entrepreneur and a big university, the Technological Air Force Institute. So the combination of knowledge, the university and the entrepreneurship, this is what makes the development grow. And Larangela already mentioned that, the need for this knowledge. And the third example is the agribusiness in Brazil, who started in the 70s when the Ministry of Agriculture Cine Lima decided to take a loan in the World Bank and create the Embrapa. And he sent to abroad to the doctors programs, a lot of young Brazilians who came back with this knowledge applied and they were received from a company in a company from the government that made them create all the projects in Embrapa. So the combination of entrepreneurship and the knowledge that makes this development grow. And based on that, some years ago, I created a school because I had been working a lot with this topic and I said, I need to create a school that thinks that way. And then we created a postgraduate school. Before that, we created a short duration courses because we couldn't make postgraduates inside the Ecological Research Institute that is totally independent and not for profit. And with 29 years, for 29 years, we are providing these courses. We graduated more than 27,000 students. And in the 
the last few years we created you know, a course on development and an MBA in social environment business administration. In the master degree, we graduated more than 150 masters in the MBA, we graduated 53 graduates. So recently being incorporated in this online system, but only one example will not, it's not going to solve. We need to scale that. We need a lot of courses. Professor Livia is going to, she's one of the mentor of the Forest Business School and Professor Foster, who is in the UFAC. So we need all these schools together and form a new story of creation and knowledge for the development of Amazon based on its knowledge and its development. If you look today, the biggest con companies in the world in terms of market value, only one uses natural resources. All the others use the era of knowledge. So we make a lot of efforts to create commodities, which is important, of course, because Brazil needs resource, but actually we would be better off if we added knowledge to something that we already have and we add value. We would change a ship of a computer that is some tons of soy. We need to change, revert this. But in order to revert this, we don't need only schools. We need to change the mindset of Brazilians. I go to the World Economic Forum because I won the award in 2019. And I always tell the story in the World Economic Forum. There is a group of young entrepreneurs that they call global shapers. These global shapers, they need to be they less than 30 years old and they have they need to have constituted two companies at least. And I live with them in the forum, but I went to see the global shapers in Manaus two years ago. There were 25 global shapers in Manaus. None of them worked for the university. There was only one company that had biodiversity because in their mindset from the Amazon in, in Brazil in general, they are looking at California. They are thinking about California. They are looking at the electronic technology world. And this is what they desire. They couldn't see yet the possibility that we have with the biodiversity based in Brazil. And you have to work on this mindset change to show that this is possible. And then Lego is going to be developed because the pieces are going to come together and you have to join the pieces, the more sophisticated pieces. And interestingly enough, the global shapers that I, that I follow, they are not making microcomputers in their garage. Now they are building sophisticated labs to work with biology. The American industry, it's easy to put together a, a laboratory and I participated in an event recently and that was shown very clearly that the young Americans are looking at biodiversity. So we need to do the same thing. We need to open our eyes. Our young people need to enter this process. And only like this, we are going to change the economy of the Amazon or a more sustainable economy and better for the country at the same time without destroying the Amazon forest, the Brazilian biodiversity. This is what I had to say. Thank you, Claudio. Very interesting. It connects easily with the next speech with the, the comments that will come from Maria Olivia Simão. as you put the, the issue of the social business school. And but before that, I would like to call for our graphic systems that is being made by Clara Dare, which is very interesting. We have been doing this for, for all the panels here in this event, organizing the information that have been 
discussed, directing to new ideas to be discussed. And this is a way for us to visualize this information, this knowledge that are being on the debates. This will be available on the website of this event and on Pagina 22's website as well as a product of this forum as well. Thank you, Clara. And now, with this interesting cue by Claudio, I'd like to call Professor Maria Olivia Simon to, to make her comments. And also, if you want to provoke our panelists to discuss these issues of training these youth thinking about innovations for the future, but we also need to prepare these youth to deal with these issues. So welcome, Professor, be my guest. Welcome, thank you. Thank you, Jonas, thank you, Pado, Luz Fernando. Very interesting what you guys have been saying. You brought interesting elements for my approach. The business school is the, is the, the state of Amazon university and you're talking about scalability and Claudio Pado showed that how can we do it in the Amazon the large size and the complexity of this arrangement of the Amazon could be through the convergence of these pieces that we have been developing in the discourse and practice of the conservation, this thinking of the development of economics. And to put an example, how can we scale from four to 30 million in, in income having this issue of conservation? So Claudio said, we have been shaping minds for some time we need to think about strategy to change the mindset of this society of the Amazon for us to realize that we have a, a wealth of biodiversity and we need to add value. And I understand Fernando's concern. We have to have volume, we have to impact economy. And that we need to convince with economic value. So, because otherwise I, I will lose the time the timing to to break this wave that is searching for commodity and how he put innovations the, the main mechanism that i see is how to work with our institutions in a way to change the premise of knowledge as it is seen in the universities in a classical way innovation is not a sin innovation is not only high tech or it or uh, technology in the point of view of this electronic umbrella that we notice. We see the need for the innovative process in also in this high-tech environment that could come from one reference of practice and knowledge that are systematized, not in the, the black and white logics of science, but it's very important to solve this key that the father said that to, to open the big treasure. Maybe it's not one key. Maybe it's a set of keys that he brings from this premise that we need to learn to understand that we have richness of knowledge. And I call your attention for something in our formation because we created a business school inside a very young university this, uh, the university arose for, with the premise of developing the countryside. We have human material, the professors and the, the installations as well, with the short-term courses focused to the interior of the state. We have uh, courses that start and end within one crop. They, they so you take the course after you graduate one class, you take it for, to another space. We cannot guarantee the development of these municipalities and to 
put a break on the development needing to come from the capital if we don't create businesses to potentialize this mechanism of uh, generation of businesses and we highlight the role of countries to bring connectivity and infrastructure devices that are needed that we don't have them on the amazon still which are connectivity and access to quality water for the industrial process and power We do not have this, but not only in, on the Amazon state, we, we don't have enough power to install a production center. These matters of basic infrastructure, we have to deal with public policies. Sebek is coordinating this network as, as a state agency with wide governance, calling for, another, for other institutions to join them is to co the complementarity of competencies. We need to have more uh, direct information. Claudio said, I started an institute that we could do free courses, but now today I have a postdoc. I have a focus on developing not only knowledge, but also products and have business management because I need to deal with people's minds to generate profit and it's not a sin to develop uh, income and thinking about uh, associated economic processes. If we look at this uh, environmental movement 20 years ago, these were not premises that were set for the Amazon. This view that we need to have great donor or any supplier that are, is interested in protecting the forest, but it could be an investor that could want to have a differentiated product. And we have to think about boxes and, and there is no box actually to think in or outside the box. We have to make the confrontation of the views because it's from this shock that the new ideas come from. And the, the youth that doesn't even know that there is a Silicon Valley or California and others that have a different perspective of the world. And then from a, a state policy, bringing this connection, these, these, this world will be much more distant for the people who are in the forest because we have uh, interregional differences within one country. For example, the Southeast and the North, we have huge differences. When we look at the North, and if we, if we consider these uh, processes that the connectivity allows, you know, we are here discussing these, these issues through a platform. And in the capital, we, we have this problem. Can you imagine the challenge of, uh, if we didn't have this to, to provide this possibility? Claudio Fernando Foster and the people who are listening to us the greatest challenge for us was to how to do the training to, to focus on promoting inside the Amazon the business we want to, not only with the Amazon products, but we want the development to be there, not only in the capitals, but also in the interior. And as Fernando said, it goes to the deep Amazon. When I don't have the connectivity, it's a very serious issue. We're starting this specialization. The, we have several people enrolled. We will select from, from 10 municipalities, the great focus in six municipalities plus the capital. We will have mediated education. We have satellite communication and the, the student goes to this municipality that we have good connection because if, if they go elsewhere, there's no connection. We're talking about this Amazon with these issues, but we have to deal with them because we have the, inno the innovation bringing to this space a lot of development in technology that other places that have difficult of uh, logistics need. There are scales that I don't want to reach, especially because we want to focus on markets that are luxury markets, for example, experimental and businesses that don't need to be uh, echoed elsewhere in the world 
because the market is to be exotic and seasonal, to have a series of values in the branding chain of this product, that it needs to be an Amazon delicacy. I love the idea of the Lego, the building blocks. I would love this reference because there are pieces I want to be huge and other ones small. So I see here that we have, and, I, and I'll I provoke Luis Fernando here. You talk about scaling. You think that this scale that you want to reach is possible with this uh, panorama I painted here, with this analogy, with what Padua brought to us, scaling, but in pieces like Lego. Your audio is up. My question was if I should answer now or, all right. Congratulations for your speech, Mario Livio. I think it's extraordinary the way you put it. The, the perspective you've been working with, congratulations for this initiative. In answering to your question directly, I think you put it very well the, the several facets of this uh, issue. We can have things that are scalable in nature and we could have things that with the uh, inner qualities are characteristic of a jewel. In the one occasion, I went to do a presentation about the investments that we were doing in the Amazon. And one of them was a plant of processing of uh, fish. We processed uh, pirarucu, tambaqui, tintado. And I was questioned by a person from the, from the audience. You are uh, raising pirarucu in, in captivity. So we, de we just developed this technology of a great quality of uh, reproduction of uh, Amazon fish. We were able to do it in captivity, which is a challenge. We changed half a degree of the temperature of the water, which made the period of uh, fertilization to be increased in 45 days. In fact, we have a, a, a hub of uh, production of Pirarucuyum captivity as you have the scalability for the Pirarucu in captivity, you will remove value from these isolated uh, communities who have the uh, traditional way of raising the Pirarucu. So I understand that we won't because I think this Pirarucu that is raised uh, in a lake and with specific conditions of nature should be much higher in value than this pirarucu that we are making to about focusing on, on the family businesses and with for people with very low income and, and low productivity and installing your tank these these people's income could be increased significantly and it's important for them to have a different product that is not just cattle but this will have a value, but the Pirarucu raised in a lake, this is a gem. This should be worth three times what we produce. This is why there is a wild salmon and captivity salmon. These, these things should be uh, together dividing the space. And we, we have space for the gems that we have in the Amazon. So I think the answer is yes, we can have these two things together and scalability is important. And these gems must be uh, uh, lapidated and, and to give the proper value for them. Professor Mario Olivia, you are on mute. Okay, I'm sorry, Jonas. Okay, I, I still have a few time, right? 
Okay, I'm just to close what, now Claudio, you have more experience that is interesting to all of us in this education process. You are not talking about a pilot thing that is going to start. This is something that is going on for a long time, 150 graduates and 53 in the MBA. What were the main challenges in this education process? Because you might receive people from all areas of knowledge. What is the main obstacle, the main barriers that you can see in your experience in the school that these people need to give so we can understand, see an entrepreneur uh, Amazon? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. Uh, thank you, Maria Olivia. Well, two things here. One is the education of our teachers because the thinking teachers tend to perpetuate. So we need less endogamy in an experience like this. You need people from different types of education and types of backgrounds, and you need this to be replicated throughout time. The time does not homogenize the knowledge of the teachers. And that took long years because I had to educate the teachers inside what we, we thought and we dreamed. And I helped them to go to different universities, to go to their doctors. And only 15 years later that we could initiate the dream of making a post-graduation because I took 15 years preparing a new group of teachers to work with us. This has to be done simultaneously with the rest. Of course, that in Brazil, things are better because you have more diversity to try to bring this. But we need to have a planning and to follow this planning. The second, the second thing is for education of teachers. The, the second is the scholarships. As incredible as it may sound, we do not have scholarships or grants, which in post-graduation is very difficult because the professional master does not, you know, is not entitled to scholarship and we will have doctors now. The most important for us is the professional master's degrees in the MBA. And without scholarships, the number of students that wants to study with us is huge, but unfortunately they went past the phase that their, their parents wants to pay for their education and they do not pro have the resources that they, that they need to take these courses. So we need a stronger public policy, more directed, less to the academic world and a little more to the professional world. We cannot abandon the academic sector. Of course, we are talking about academy in, in a certain way, but we need to have a better division and people's education more uh, towards the problem solving and less to resolution of academic problems that are more complex. I think this balance is important. Thank you very much, Claudio, for your questions and let's reflect on that. Thank you, Jonas. Thank you. Very interesting, this first exchange here that we have. Professor Maria Livia brought these ideas in a very strategic way because she is the professor of UFA, as I didn't say yeah. previously, and she was the executive secretary of the government of Amazonas, and she was a director of our fund foundation for research. We are going to discuss more about this, and I would like to to call Professor Foster Brown, who is the professor, he's a senior scientist of the research, Woodwell Research Center, and professor of Feder, professor, Federal University of Acre, and among many other things that he develops and does nowadays. More details, we can look at some of our guests with their bios. So we don't waste a lot of time and give more spaces to the remarks of Professor Foster Brown. I'd like to call him now. The floor is yours. You can make your comments and ask questions so we can discuss about this topic. Welcome. You're, you're on mute, Professor. 
Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone involved in the organization of this event because this is fantastic. I am learning a lot of things only with this session that we have right now. I'm going to prepare, I'm going to prepare this, the speakers for the scale. I'm going to talk about this now. I'm going to say that this is a section of solutionology. And I say this as a problem expert. I am a university professor, the traditional one. And I spend most of my time defining problems to affect this part of Amazon and this part of the planet. So being able to talk to you about possible solutions is a relief but also a responsibility. In this panel, this panel is about the education of talents in society. In this part of the Amazon, in order to drive and boost the bioeconomy in the 21st century. But we need to remember one thing, the bioresource, the most important bioresource is between our ears of millions of people, especially people here in, in Amazon. How do we prepare the minds is the base of three questions that I'm going to ask. The first one is that we recognize that we have deficiencies in the education in up levels. And let's think on how to solve them. Let's look at the base. You put three areas of focus here, the academia, productive sector, and local community. The nexus for all of them where things beginning, begin is the 21st century. We know that we need societies with the learning capacity, the continuous learning capacity. What do we know now, 23 year, 20, 30 years, a goal that we will change now. We need to have a basic understanding of how the Amazon and their cities work. And as you said, the initiative issue. Having the initiative or the entrepreneurship, it's not something that is born with the person. This is something that you can develop. And also, Members of the society, they need to learn four languages, mathematics, written Portuguese, read and written speaking and spoken Spanish. Sustainability of the bioeconomy in the Amazon will depend on this training in the basic education. So the first question, how do you propose to do this and in how long? Now going back to the academic sector, we need more research. This is pretty obvious, but we do need to solve the bottlenecks that stop the knowledge from being spread. Right now, the public universities are suffering a financial crisis, a technological revolution, and a functional crisis caused by the pandemic. But there is something about crisis. There are two different words, danger and opportunity. So what suggestions do you have to reorganize the universities in order to act in the bioeconomy of the Amazon? And my third question is, only a little detail, how to do this and how much this will cost and how to pay for this change. So these are the three questions that I wanted to ask you. And Maria Olivia, if you, if you want to answer. I am very curious about the questions, about the answers, sorry. So thank you, Professor Foster. So in order to follow with this, remarks and comments. 
so we can follow the order. So we start with Luiz Fernando Laranja, and then Professor Claudio, and then Professor Maria Olivia. Okay, Luiz Fernando, the floor is yours. Well, before anything, it is a great pleasure to interact with Professor Foster Brown here. I'm being penalized because I am the first one to answer difficult questions, but let's see. Let's bring some contribution here. About the basic teaching, the basic learning, I try to see this issue with the great optimism not to be depressed. And the, the best optimism sometimes works because it is very interesting because what happened in Brazil Let's limit the history place from Fernando Henrique and Lula administration. And I'm going to mention these both to avoid the politics here. But this was a uh, considerable investment in the universalization of the basic education. And I think that as amazing as it sounds, I can see in a certain optimism. Because in fact, the school reaches the most remote places in these countries. In, from the logistics perspectives, that this doesn't matter if they are good or bad. I'm talking about distance. And there was one occasion where that I was visiting Professor Jari in the, the borders with Amapá and Pará. And then people took me to the last community we went over the, the river Jari, and we went to a very difficult to access place. There was a church in that community and there was one school and a market from a person that unified the collection of Brazilian nuts for the boats. And I got in the school, every time I visit some place, I like to go to the schools. And there were children studying and I, the professor, the teacher stopped the classes and because they saw me and I said, okay, a new person is coming, so let's, let's hear. And inside the class, there were children, younger children, older children, and it caught my attention at the time because, okay, this is weird because this is one classroom with one teacher and different ages in the group, in the, the children. I said, what are you teaching here? I'm teaching math. Jose, but are you, are, you are a math teacher or are you a teacher that teaches everything? No, I am a math teacher. I'm graduated in math. So why do you have different ages of children here? Because inside this classroom, there are four grades, the second, third, fourth, and fifth grades. Okay, so you're doing magic here because you can teach four grades at the same time. Well, what caught my attention is that because something so spectacular, those children were there and they have the privilege to have one math teacher. As adverse the condition as it is, in this structure that they should have four grades inside the, the classroom. But I look at optimistic with the class half full is that it's something so spectacular to those children to have a math teacher because 10 years ago it was impossible. So I look at those children and I said, these children have a potential because they are at school, they are going to school and they are studying math. And on the, on the top of the, the, the blackboard, there was a, a quote, studying is an act of love. So I see that on top of this base, very precarious base, but at least we have a base that the children were going to school. This is the base that we have to work on and we have the challenge to improve the basic school. We have a wonderful challenge, a huge challenge. There is, it doesn't make sense to have four grades inside a classroom, but it makes sense to have a math teacher teaching those children. So I always tell this story because I try to find optimism even in the middle of a, a unfavorable scenario. I think this is what we have to work on, the reorganization of the universities. I think this is a, a government policy. 
there is a, a devaluation of the public university in a in a absurd manner. But this this is a problem. And, but I don't really have what to say on that. To go to the last issue about financing, I'm going too long. I think we need to attract in some way and to involve in some way the private sector for them to pay some of the bill because in the moment that we associate the development opportunity for technology and businesses, I mean, maybe there is some opportunity for the private sector to bring their contribution to allocate resources in the research and development area. I'm sorry to be to have been so long, but the questions have been very intriguing. All right, Luis, it, it's fine. Now, Claudio Pado, the floor is yours. You are on mute. All right, it's very good to be in an event like this because there are very smart questions. And being the Amazon, in fact, there are entrepreneurs everywhere. This is extraordinary. I taught in Acre many years ago and you introduced me to some students that fascinated me. Where did these kids come from? because they were different and they had the same education as the rest of them. You can always take a group and try to, to go from there. I don't think this is the solution though. The solution in Brazil needs a real uh, revolution and not being possible to do that. We have a huge chance of, let me tell you a story. Plin Ribeiro is my partner at Biofilica. It's a company. He graduated from INSP in Sao Paulo and in his final paper, this was his uh, final paper in the course. And we ended up being friends and he asked me, can you send me to have my master's in the Columbia University? Because I have a connection there. But Plinio, okay, I will, but with one condition. You will be uh, working in the Amazon for two years. Well, in the Amazon for two years, yes. If you want to go to Colombia, you, you must go to the, the Amazon first. And today he thanks me because it's the best thing that could have happened to him because it was extraordinary opportunity for him. And he, when he got to Columbia University, there they have 10,000 guys that, who are better than you for just graduating at the Innsbruck. He went through the Amazon and when he got there, he was different. He had knowledge that nobody had. So why do I tell the story here? There's a huge chance if we start to do it's a interchange in Brazil, but we need to, to fight xenophobia. We need to open the doors to send people around Brazil and from back and forth to to cover the lack of uh, teachers and, and form a new generation and then it will walk on on its own but we need to take an important step for this to happen it would be a great solution if we were able to do a, a mechanism of this sort this is a suggestion and another thing is on the, on the reorganization of universities, and I have been a, a professor at a federal level, it, the structure is very complicated, the management, and, but I don't see it as impossible. The doors must be opened as well to everything, for companies and without fear. There's no boogeyman out there. It's not the capitalist world that will invade if you don't open yourself to it. You just have to organize yourself and take the advantage and do the changes you want to. 
these are the suggestions that come to my mind based on my experience through the years. Perfect, thank you. Now, Maria Olivia Simão, I'd like to, because I'd like to listen to you now, be my guest. Wow, Foster Brown, it was worth the afternoon. I love the question that the brain seems larger than the skull. These are such questions. My brain is throbbing. It's, it's uh, trying to think of different alternatives. The formation of teachers, as Claudio put, for them to change the mindset, to create a new perspective, we had to invest and break the endogeny. We are stuck with teaching what we learned. And the, the moment that we are living is making possible for us to break this structure. We're inside this liquidity that these spaces are losing the limits that were very well defined. And some authors talk about this, the workspace and home space and the space for entrepreneurship. And with this craziness that we are living, this transformation that is coming as an impact on us. And I see it is at a good moment of the crisis between uh, danger and opportunity. I think this is an opportunity because there are no walls anymore. Labs, home, my office. Of course, I will take time to redefine and organize myself. But this is shaking us. This process is shaking us. So we need to go to the basis. The, the science in the school program, it's perfect what you said about the, the education in the Amazon. And of, in fact, it was in the Fernando Henrique administration. We had a state policy that it said no more layman teachers. Yeah, they will give diplomas through TV. It will be making teachers by force. Yes, yeah, some of the processes could be criticized by the, the quickness and the need to, to attend public policy, but many surfed this wave and we changed this uh, panorama where we didn't have people with uh, third degree education. And the University of Amazonas graduated more than 70,000 teachers. And we got the resource from ministry to intermediate this formation process in the interior of the state. We, we found an opportunity there and we can face, uh, we can find people with superior formation, giving classes in unimaginable places. When we have children in different ages to, to, to be taught in the same classroom, but I think this is about the demystification of the curse of the serious teaching because the serious teaching was problematic people said but we have active methodologies that say that we let's put people with different views to think of a different curriculum that is not uniform there is no uh, curriculum matrix that is uniformed uniformly thinking and on the solution of problems we have to search for knowledge I will use this, okay, Foster. Mathematics usable, English read and heard. This is very good because these are distinct skills. We're looking for the current pedagogy. Sometimes we can't make them to realize that we cannot put the same mold on everybody. We have to complement competencies and respect limitations. This doesn't mean that they are more or less potent or more or less special and academia still has this process that needs to be unraveled. We understood the, as a public policy, the pro engineers as RHTI were two processes of forceful uh, imposition of people who came from basic education. This was a, a public policy of the state of Amazonas, where the kids got on their high school diploma formation, 
in uh, with being the, the whole day at school, with more than the curriculum, complementing with mathematics, Portuguese, chemistry, physics, and creation. They should solve problems and, and in one week create a solution for that problem. And we, people, we have people mapped from this country that are all over Brazil, some with doctorate, and there are people in the health area, there are physiotherapy. These are induction policies. We have to mix, not to break everything, but to have some experiences and what Claudio said for us to have less endogeny because we still have a world inside Brazil. And in Brazil, we have low migration, of my, induced migration. Only when someone uh, you know, packs a bag and goes to, to get to know the Amazon and get, falls in love and stays there. Or uh, people from, from abroad coming with the curiosity of being in the Amazon. There are some things that could be developed, but this has to be pre-planned. And Amazon, moving in the Amazon is too expensive. We need more interaction programs. And I see the pandemic as a great situation for this. We'll have a lot of classes and activities mediated through these processes. But for the Amazon, Brazilian state needs to look that we need connectivity. I always talk about this. Brazilian state, we are four, maybe 5% of everything about technology and superior education. If you don't provide a, a connectivity based public policy, this is going to be a problem later on. And, and Professor Brown mentioned something that made our brains to be larger than the schools. Thank you, Jonas, for the for the presentations, for the opportunity. Thank you. I, I'd like to take the chance here because we still have 20 minutes, but we have some questions on the chat. Can I have before the question, can I tell something? We had a uh, research with communities that we work on Rio Negro. I told some people already this. We asked the youth what they wanted not to go to Manaus. And I expected the, the answers to be education, sport. and But the answer was broadband. Because it opens the world. It gives you sport, education, and everything. If, if we don't do this, it won't work out. We won't move forward. Perfect, Claudio. Following this thread, I, I would like to, to take this uh, opportunity that Professor Brown introduced. Professor uh, Maria Oliva Simon mentioned what she lived in the Amazon and also Claudio with this uh, collectivity issue. We were not able to have Ana Paula here, who is the the president of uh, COEX in Carajás, and she would bring this view of the basis and how we could understand from her point of view, how we could invest and innovate in the formation of people from the base. And so we have this case with, with the question from Carlani Barros basic education and professional techniques. How can we develop it in all educational levels and also consider in this innovation issue? We have these two paths. We have to invest in formation, but I think, and through your speeches, uh, we need to invest in creative minds. Several ways to stimulate these youth providing connectivity and proper formation. And without this uh, stimulus to creativity and innovation, we will still be investing in the same wheel. Just to provoke, for us to have this reflection, be my guest, for, make your comments. Luis Fernando, then Claudio, then Professor Mario Oliva Simão, then Forster Brown. 
if you could be short, we still have two questions to be interesting to be discussed. Okay, I'm going to be very brief here. And because it was already well put by Professor Maria Olivia and by Claudio, I think that the encouragement to creativity is to stimulate the youngsters to be creative and to develop projects. This is the starting point of the innovation process. I think it is perfect. It was well put by Professor Maria Olivia and, and Claudio. Great, Professor Claudio, you can go on. Sometimes I think that you you have to finish with schools. Education should be everywhere, and we are getting close to make this possible, in, as I see it. And the pandemic is going to help us, as Professor. Professor Maria said, so in our school, we are changing radically the, the way to, to end with the classroom and make everything facing, of, co of course, many things will be online because of the pandemic, but another part, I take the students to spend one week in our boats in the Negro River to leave the Amazon and their daily routine I think it's made, it makes more to education than one year sitting in the classroom. So I dream with an education like this that is present everywhere, which is not something very easy to do. We need a drastic change, but it's not impossible. It is possible. It's a little exact exaggeration of my part, but I like to dream big in order to reach things. Great, Professor Maria Olivia. Well, I think that this is what we talked about here. If we want to break this barrier between these spaces and basic education, higher education and middle education, if we allow the interaction, I think this is a good way. The other one is the maximum. I don't, I cannot have good brains as Forster said. No, I think it was Claudia who talked about the, between the two years, something that changes the world. If this is what makes a difference and some people are afraid of the artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is thought of first and it became a perfect better. So you, you have to stop thinking about that. So this capacity, this ability to think, this is what we have to encourage. We were talking about creativity, the word creativity. Creativity is to put their experiences. It's better than reading a book. So we have to feel the experience and we are challenged to experience and and solve as Foster creates a lot of questions, but we are challenged to solve complex questions because we cannot solve them with uh, the cause and effect. So we have to rehearse a lot this interaction to solve problems together with many different views. Now, this is what we already talked about this panel and the other panels about connectivity in terms of collaboration, to be in, in contact and create these networks. And Hisa does that. We need more resources in our lives, more network actions. This is the result of a network collaboration. Professor Foster, I wanted to talk about three things. The critical thinking, collaboration and creativity. These are things for us to develop at school. I had a sad experience when I came to Brazil to start my classes in the university. I was talking to a teacher in the University of Rio and she told me that she 
every year she tries to find students to enter the program in university the freshman students because they are more interested after two years or some years in the university they lose creativity they lose their will they lose interest and this is a tragedy in from the size of brazil actually and this is the challenge how to stimulate this creativity to innovate There is another question here from Eduardo Pizzo from our chat room that what are the opportunities and challenges offered by the implementation of a new instrument, especially in the itinerary of technic, technic, in, technician and professional courses? Oh, Luis Fernando, if, if you follow the same order. I'm going to pass this to the people who are more involved with education. So I will leave this to Maria Olivia or Foster and Claudia. Can I go? Yes. For some time, we are trying to implement in our school something that I key that it's the treasure map because it's a map with a lot of dots and a lot of axes. But the name that I like to give is the individual journey of knowledge in which the students can build their own knowledge journey along with some supervisors. And this changes in the law allows us to do that. But I don't know if this will happen but it facilitated it, now it's easier. And I think, and I hope that this happens. I think it is difficult with the deficiencies that we have, but every student is a student. Of course, that in a certain parameters, an individual knowledge journey, it makes a wonderful difference. The 21st century education has to be like this. Everyone has to build their own story. Thank you. This same process we saw when the Brazilian state was working with the modification of the basic education with the national curriculums, the permission and the IDB, the, the LDB, shows the, the capacity to the school showing their own curriculums. So this is something that came ready from the ministry. There is a flexibilization that the school should say, what is the individual that they want to graduate from the political and pedagogical program without the ability of the technical body to understand how to operationalize that. So we opened that possibility, but in order to leverage this possibility, I need to have teacher training but how to break this without having people that have the critical thinking and the licensing. So people want to have a bachelor degrees instead of licensed degrees. They wanted to go to Harvard because they thought it was more noble, the background. Even in the master's degrees, they went through a process of having to prove what they came for. So this was not something that they want a doctor and a master that is easier. Just we, they needed the applicability in this process. So we need to break these currents. And this comes from a basic thing, being able to have a good education. Because sometimes in the education we have a legal artificiality, whereas we do not have the desired insights what is going to operationalize the law. And in the modification in the curriculum of the high school, there is a possibility, but we need to have capacity and we need to move forward. Sometimes we execute a policy and then the technical body could acquire. And I am part of the teaching process. I am an educator inside the licensure. 
So this is an experience that I am living in the areas of knowledge in a process that I collaborate, that is an engineer training program. When I was there in the public policies, look at the, I was reading a magazine in 2014 and we mapped and we verified what was said with, even with the pandemic that we lack developers all over the world. We see a need to form new knowledge. So this is what Claudio says, the flexibilizations and to stimulate that our young person from the university, they can see that they can build complementary knowledge and information of curriculum that is directed and focused. So we have the knowledge trail with mentorship for the training of engineers in seven axes related to the engineering backgrounds. So stimulating people to make them study, thinking on this insertion on a new reality on in the labor markets or in employment and less than passing the SATs and going to the university. So if you go to the, pass the SATs and go to the university or you don't have this anymore. So the space that we need of technicians and entrepreneurs are more than what we need in the academic background. Thank you very much, Professor Maria Lisa Foster Brown, your last comments. We have an urgent need. I cannot say with competence about curriculum reform that is happening, but I can talk about the results of the education. We have the need, and it's evidence because of the pandemic that the, we have this the scientific knowledge that is generated with the students in the high school. This is critical. I'm going to give an example. At the end of the 70s, we could observe that there was a lot of We had this, uh, this recycling that was going on in the Amazon. So in 1984, there was an article at Science talking about this event. And the students of the postgraduate studies in, the, in high school, they didn't know that. Decades ago, they already knew. They, it was already in the scientific world but it was not incorporated in the educational system. And that generated political problems because many politicians said, okay, I'm going to the school. And in other schools, you can see that, but that's nothing to do with what we learn here. So this aspect is part of the reform that needs to happen. And I think that the university teachers need to involve and check to the public through the high school and the basic education. Thank you, thank you very much. We are going to the last five minutes of our panel. So unfortunately we have to close, but the, our idea for the forum of all the panels is to be closer to the articulation and to keep this contact this conversation doesn't need to end here. We are going to follow, to go on with these conversations. Can you say something in the end? Yes, I'm going to ask you to find, give your final remarks starting to Professor Luciano Laranja because he has to leave the meeting and then go to Professor Claudio Mario Living Foster Brown. I'd like to, to thank for the opportunity and congratulate you for the initiative and the topic and to reinforce that I think this is a great topic. We are searching for a solution for the Amazon and it goes through education and innovation. This is the topic. This is where the thing starts. This is very timely and I'm, I'm grateful to be a part of this panel. Thank you, Professor. Claudia? I try to visit all the experience I hear about in the world and I go there to look up closely 
and I went to Arizona State University because someone told me I should. And they finished, they ended all the departments and they operated through labs, and multidisciplinary labs. This was a fight with the head of departments, but in the end, it was an amazing experience as I can see it. And I would like to, to say something else here, that Amazon is loved by all the world. And we need to take this chance to, to have international partnerships for education and for everything to end xenophobia and say, we, we have the condition to run the show here. Let's open the doors because everybody wants to work with us and let's transform this in real change headed by us and with the involvement of everybody who loves the Amazon. So this is the message I'd like to leave here and also thank for the opportunity and to be that I am very proud of this event in these two weeks of events that we are organizing here. Thank you, Claudio, very good. Professor Maria Olivia, I'd like to thank you for a lovely afternoon that we are here reflecting. Luis, Claudio, Foster, Jonas, I'm thank you for, for all the conversation that we had the, to put different points of view. I worked in the EP, I was a, a grantee from Foz to, to Alto Solimões. It was my field work there. I was financed by the, the OEA. EP helped me a little bit as well. I couldn't uh, leave my job at the time and I had a family, but I'm with you. This process of formation, these possibilities need to continue. We must have new networks and open more and interact more and invite the colleagues to this experience. I would like to, to make the invitations for you to for the, our business school. We will have many entrepreneurs that will have cases there and many others who have gone bankrupt will tell us what the mistakes they made because sometimes the mistakes are more uh, fruitful to be studied than, uh, than everything else. Thank you for this wonderful afternoon. We thank you, Professor. Professor Foster, I learned so much today. I would like to thank you. And I will finish going back to the problem. The climate is changing. We don't have infinite time. We need to act now so we can take the chance of the moments that we still have and I would like to, to leave with the urgency of this topic here. Perfect, Professor Foster. Uh, but about climate, we had on, the, on panel number two, we had Klasi Moraes from the, U, the climate leaders, and she brought this issue of the involvement of youth focused on this uh, issue. And we will have the, the climate that is a hackathon uh, focus on climate issues that will happen in October and the continuous continuation of our forum will have more information on the road. I would like to thank all the, the, the panelists and the commentators, especially Claudio Padua, which is with us in the organization of this forum. He's part of our initiative and helped us to, to construct this panel and thank you, Claudio, and to all the participants and people who are watching us. Enjoy, like, share, and we'll have more content tomorrow. See you there. Thank mm -hmm. you.